Okay, welcome everyone. I wouldn't say I invented the disruptor. I'm definitely more with the discovered yesterday, as it was mentioned, because it's really a whole bunch of ideas stolen from other places. There's sort of some people like Tony Horrors actually here have noticed that some of its ideas from CSP, some of the other ideas are from the work of Lamport particularly. And so actually there's a lot of really, really great stuff in concurrency that we're kind of rediscovering again because we don't bother to read a lot of the great history of the past and stuff. What I want to talk this morning about is a lot of my quest over the last 10 years to find algorithms that give predictable latency, because particularly if you're working in finance, we need to be able to respond and respond in a timely manner. If we don't respond in a timely manner, things can kind of go wrong. And particularly, the more spinning wheels we have, the more things that are happening at the same time, the more likelihood we have of not being predictable in our latency. Like, does anyone here have kids? Have you noticed that the more kids you try to organize, the, the more unpredictable it will be before you leave the house, are you going to do anything? Yeah. Concurrency is very like that as well, is the more things we try to juggle, the harder it will be to try and be predictable and try and do something in a timely manner. But there's a kind of interesting thing about being responsive. And one way of looking at it is if you are not responsive to whatever your SLA deadline is, you're effectively unavailable. So a system that doesn't respond is just the same as a system that's not there. We can't really tell the difference, so we need to be predictable. The more predictable we are, the easier it is for us to work out what's going on. So what am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk about causes of blocking in algorithms, because it's actually one of the fundamental issues why things aren't predictable. I'm going to talk a little bit about what we mean by latency. We misuse terms an awful lot, particularly this industry. I, I love how we just don't even look up things in the dictionary when we put names on stuff. And one of my favorites is random access memory. How is it random? It's arbitrary. Please use the dictionary. We've got loads and loads and loads of examples like this. But, so we'll cover latency a little bit. I'm going to talk a bit about locks and queues. And also going into all other alternative FIFOs, because it's really interesting what structures we have out there. I also want to look at a little bit of where we go next. I spend a lot of time working on the JVM, but I also work in native languages. And it's interesting how things have not moved on the JVM, particularly in some areas. It's done wonderful things in other areas, but in some areas it just hasn't moved, and it needs to move forward. So let's start off, and it's really, I want to talk about the blocking and what are the causes of us being slowed down. Because Whenever we're blocked, we can't make progress. So when you get many of these spinning wheels happening at the same time, whenever one is waiting on another, we are effectively blocked. And that means we do not make progress. And the lack of progress causes a lot of our problems that we have with being responsive. So we're going to get over this blocking problem. There are two major causes of blocking when we look at this from an algorithmic perspective. The first is when we have these concurrent algorithms, we have to deal with things like mutual exclusion, letting one thread and let another thread know that something's complete, this handover sort of stage, and we're also synchronizing and rendezvousing at different points. So this feeds into our algorithms. This is going to be the body of what I'm going to talk about today. But just for reference, it's really important to note that probably one of the biggest causes of our outliers in our system are systemic pauses. This is things like GC pauses. We've got things called stop the world pauses inside our VM. GC is one example of it, but there are many others, like revoking a bias lock. There's lots of other things to do with compilation and different things inside our VM that stops every single thread. And when all those threads are stopped, it can then do some work that needs to be done. The problem is if we get into bigger and bigger core counts, bringing all these threads to a stop is becoming a big <coughs> issue. Amdahl's law starts to hunt you down. Then we've got to get all these threads started again. And so being aware of this, but it's not just the JVM. It's things like transparent huge pages underneath our Linux, which most people are not even aware of. There's lots of things that need to be configured. And there's lots of things happening in hardware, P states, C states, SMIs, all of this sort of stuff is kind of interesting to be aware of. So kind of leave that aside, because that could be a whole great talk on its own. I want to focus on the first one. Now, when we start focusing on the first one, our concurrent algorithms and how do we coordinate what's going on, we have two major means of doing this. One is we use locks, which I'm not going to talk very much about other than point out some of the serious issues we have with locks. I'm going to talk about using things like CAS instructions. Who here has heard of CAS instruction? Good. Well, plenty of people have got that. So the ability to do atomic operations in hardware where we can compare and set 
So if I'm going to read a value, I can update that value if it hasn't conditionally changed. This is one of our fundamental building blocks that we have. It's also got some fundamental scalability limitations which we'll go through. And they're hard to program to, by the way. So let's go back and let's talk about latency for a second. What do we mean? Well, this is a lot of my life. I turn up at many different airports and I form queues. But pretty much everything you need to know about queuing theory happens in these sort of places. Because we talk about, you've heard of response time, latency, all sorts of different things. We mix and match all of these terms. But what do they really mean? And if you don't pull them apart, you can't model a system. If you can't model a system, you can't predict how it's going to behave at the end of the day. So let's look at this from a queuing theory perspective. We'll have services that we need to take. And that's known as the service time. So in the previous example, whenever you go up to the desk, you're now being serviced. There's a time it takes you to be serviced when you reach that desk and then you get through. But there's a time when you're latent. You have to wait to get to the desk in the first place. That is your latency, typically. Like think about the names, like we don't look stuff up in the dictionary. It's the time you're latent. Response time is the total time from when you go to use the service, the fact that you queue to use it, and then you get serviced as well. So those combined times are your response time. What's really interesting is what people don't typically talk about is the time to NQ and DQ. And in many cases, it's actually the most significant time if you actually measure. I, I love the comment yesterday about science. Now, for me, fundamentally, if we are trying to do science, one of the things we must do is follow the scientific method. That means we have to measure. We have to do experiments. We can't just keep theorizing without measurement, and that becomes really important. And if you start measuring, you start being surprised where real costs are, where real time goes, the interesting things that are going on. So we'll kind of come back to that. But what's interesting we feed into this is when you look at queuing theory, if I go to use any given resource and it's being used a lot, the chances are I will end up having to wait. I have to wait to do that. I end up blocked. And this blocking is what causes problems in our algorithms. It also causes the unpredictability. So for example, if something takes one unit of time to do something and things are arriving at a rate of one every two units of time, it's only 50% utilized. So if you go to use that, there's a 50% chance there's somebody already using the service, so you'll have to queue. So then that means your average response time at that stage will be 1.5 units of time. And that's why we're kind of looking at around this for utilization. As you increase utilization, you go up this curve. It's basic probability and what's going on. This is 100-year-old math back from Erlang. So if we want our systems to be responsive, one of the first things we must do is make sure utilization is relatively low. If you're very highly utilized, you will not be responsive. Kind of a little tip for anybody in the room who happens to be a project manager, and if you want to have your teams running a very high utilization, they will not be responsive to your requests. The same thing happens in the world of people. We're all just in a system, and these things still hold and still work. So that's kind of one thing to be aware of. So when we're talking about latency, as far as I'm talking about in this talk, I'm talking about the time will be blocked, will be waiting, will be latent, waiting for something to happen. So, with that context, let's go into looking at locks and queues, because if we've got all these spinning wheels, the thing we want to do more than anything in concurrency, I've been writing concurrent code now for about 25 years, and I run away from shared mutable state like the plague. And you need to get into that way of thinking. So what's the best way to share things is when you've got a message pass. You communicate that way to share your state rather than having the shared mutable state. So you're going to spend a lot of time dealing with queues. But as I mentioned, we can often spend more time in queuing and dequeuing than we are actually spending in time in the queue itself. And this is all about the evils of blocking and what goes on in our queue implementations themselves. So let's look at what we get in the JDK. We've got the queue implementation, and the two typical methods that people use are put and tech. These are blocking API calls. And as a result, they have to use certain implementations under the cover. What they mean 
that they basically boil down to is condition variables. So right back to good old POSIX condition variables, these will appear in Java as wait and notify or signal and await that are under the cover. So for example, I go to text from a queue. If there's nothing in the queue, I get put asleep. Whenever something is offered to the queue leader or put into the queue, you must wake up that thread that has fallen asleep. That requires condition variables to do that. Now let's go back to the science thing and look at measuring them. What's involved? So let's say I'm going to just boil it down to its essence. I'm going to use two condition variables. One to do a ping and one to do a pong. So think of like sonar, ping pong. That's how you get a response from something. So just two simple things to work out what's going on. And then I'm going to record all of this in a histogram. Histograms are critically important here. Don't use averages. Averages just lie. They hide everything that's interesting that's going on. You've got to do a quantile distribution of this to see what's in there and what's happening. So I'm going to send a ping and get a response in a pong just between two threads over and over again. And I'm going to record this all in a histogram. What does this look like when I do a quantile distribution on this? We end up like this whereby if you look along here, up to 90% is all happening in around eight and a bit microseconds. This is on a very well-tuned, fast machine. But eight microseconds just to send between two threads. That is a load of CPU cycles, a load of opportunity to have executed instructions on modern processors. So that's just the time between two threads. You see, a little pop quiz, how long does it take to go between two machines on a good network these days? Any ideas? 10 milliseconds? Keep going a lot lower. Less, less than a microsecond if you're close. Less on the wire, but let's say go user space to user space. With a good 10 gig -E network with kernel bypass technology, we're looking at around two microseconds one way. After messaging, that's five and a half micros, like full messaging stack, round trip between two machines. That is less than going between two threads with condition variables, between machines with full stack. So this is not an efficient way to do so. But look what else is happening. We go out to the higher percentiles, and it starts getting up <coughs> into the tens of microseconds to signal between two threads to do stuff. And the max in the histogram is over five milliseconds. This is a serious problem in making our system scale and work. In fact, you try to throw load through this, you do not get that many events per second, like a few million, and it does not scale with numbers of cores. It's a fundamentally limiting thing. So that's the thing that I'm talking about. I'm measuring that on its own. That's actually the, the really best case scenario. That's a micro benchmark where the caches are hot, the operating system code is hot, nothing else is going on. If you measure real world applications, you're lucky to get 50 microseconds on average for that one way, not even mind the round trip. So this is incredibly costly. It's not a good way to signal between two threads. So let's look at what other options do we got? Do we have any other APIs that are better that are in there, and the non-blocking APIs are a good thing to look at. Offer and poll being the two examples in this case. What happens if I offer and poll between two threads? Well, for reference, you can go test all this yourself. One of the things I'm a great believer in is the scientific method. So you've got to put out your experiment. You've got to let other people independently verify it. Code's all up on GitHub. I tested this with Java 8, update 6. I'm running Ubuntu 15.04. I'm running it in performance mode from the scaling governor, and that's the processor I'm running on. So this is actually a fairly slow processor, not a really, really fast processor, so you get a feel for what's possible, kind of typical. Now, let's look at what is different ways I'm going to measure this. So one way I want to do is I want to increase the number of producers. I want to try it with one, two, three contended producers. Why am I not going to do 500 producers? It's a quad core machine. You will only ever have three producers at any one point in time. If you run 500 threads, you'll be measuring the scheduler and not the contention on the algorithm. So you've got to know what you're measuring, what you're testing. I want to also measure the mean and the 99 percentile. Why have I stopped at the 99 percentile rather than going to four nines, five nines? 
because beyond the 99 percentile, you typically find all the systemic pauses. That stuff's all interesting, but it's interesting for a different case. So I want to look at the algorithmic interesting things that are going on. Now, three implementations that you get inside the JDK and a baseline implementation. So the baseline implementation is taking Lamport's work from 1976 on circular buffers, updated with some of the concepts on fast flow. It gives the best latency I have seen of any queue implementation out there. So I use that as the baseline. So that's what you're targeting. That's what the hardware can typically do at its best. What the things look like above that. So the baseline for sending one message to one thread and getting a response back again is 167 nanoseconds using lock-free algorithms in this way. In fact, that's a really awesome implementation. It's not just lock-free, it's also <coughs> weight-free. And that's it's incredibly predictable. So if I go from the mean to the 99 percentile, it doesn't actually move that much. It's a really nice, elegant algorithm. It's one of the perfect examples of why you want to go one-to-one -one rather than many-to-many -many or many-to-one or anything like that. Then I'm going to look at array blocking queue, link blocking queue, and concurrent link queue. That's what we get inside the JDK as our typical options. So that was the one case. Let's look at a different case here now. And that's where I want to send 100 messages and get a response. Why am I sending 100 and get a response? Because real world traffic comes in bursts. It never counts nice and predictable. Also, I want to measure contention because if I'm sending one getting a response, one getting a response, when multiple threads do that, they interleave so well and you don't get much contention. When you burst in from multiple threads, they will contend on the same data in the same algorithm. And so we have to deal with that case. So now things are looking very different. Our baseline still looks wonderful. So that kind of shows you how good this sort of algorithm is at this, but the others start failing. In fact, look how bad it starts getting in the 99 percentile. And I'm not saying I'm sending 100 and acting each one of them. I'm sending 100 and getting one act back. So I'm bursting. It's pipelined. It should go really well. Our modern processors are superb with pipelined operations. But that isn't good. 180 microseconds, that is multiple round trips to another machine for what it should just be a pipeline burst. Not a good place to be. Also, if you look at the JDK, one of the things to take out, the best implementation at the bottom here is concurrent link queue, and I'll use that as our baseline going forward against other implementations. But there's some fundamental flaws here. If you start using these systems, how do you apply back pressure? So say a concurrent link queue is a linked queue that has got an unbounded size. Unbounded size queues are a disaster waiting to happen. They always grow unbounded. Producers and consumers get on balance, and you get out of memory errors, and your system crashes. Not a good place to be. Their size methods have locks around them. So if you're, going to, if you're going to call the size on something, and if you're good at queuing theory, we need to know the size of our queue. The size ends up blocking. It has a Heisenberg effect on what's going on. We can't measure flow rates. There's nothing in the API that tells us the flow rate through the queue. They generate garbage. And they're also not good with fan out. So they're kind of like almost an interesting academic exercise that have not really been tried in the real world. I find in real world applications, I cannot use what comes with the API. Not because of performance, because they don't have the features you actually require in a real world application. Oh yeah, and by the way, if you call size method on concurrent link queue, it walks the, the, the whole linked list. It's not an order one operation. <laughs> Pretty bad stuff. So what alternatives are there? What else is out there? Well, what I want to do is, first of all, look at it's in two groups. One is inter-thread FIFO. So basically, in the same memory process, how do we share between two threads? And one of the ones I can talk quite comfortably about is the disruptor, since I control myself for having come up with it in the first place. And how does this work? Well, one of the things we want to do is get over the garbage problem, so we don't want to allocate all the time. So the disruptor allocates a ring buffer of references. It also pre-allocates the objects in advance, and you can use those objects over and over again. And that gets us around a lot of the copying and allocation problem, which helps with the throughput. How does the algorithm work? It's quite simple, really. So you start off, the producers have to claim a slot. And so 
they will race and they'll update the claim sequence here. So I'll, I'll read it as value zero. I'll then do a compare and set to the value of one. If I succeed, that slot's mine. If I feel I go around in a loop and I try that again. So I have to do the spinning cast loop on that. Now once I've claimed one, I can then use slot one in here and I can update that object at that stage. This is all nice and simple. Whenever I'm finished, what do I do? I update the cursor to say that up to slot one is now available on the other side. This is very similar variation on the bakery algorithm from Lamport back again in the 70s. We sort of move forward from that. What does the producer do? Well, the producer can read something out when they see the cursors move forward and they update the gating sequence. And so just think of this as head and tail of a queue and you move forward with this. This is all done with just do memory ordering operations, no need for locks on any of this and it, it works quite nice and it performs quite well. But there's a kind of interesting thing is how do I deal with the setting the cursor? If these things are all happening in parallel, so what you want to do is you want to move forward the cursor whenever the cursor has got to be the value before where you've claimed. So you wait. We have a blocking operation. Now, whenever we put this algorithm together and we used it in LMAX, this actually worked really well because we always had more cores than we had threads that needed to run. If you get into a world where you have got more threads than you've got cores, you end up with threads being swapped out and scheduled. Now what happens if one of those threads got swapped out after it claimed the sequence, it started working with the slot, and it has not updated the cursor yet, and it takes an interrupt and doesn't run again for maybe many milliseconds. You end up with this thread busy spinning around here, waiting for it, using CPU, and the CPU can't actually be allocated to the other one. It's a real bad mistake we made in this algorithm. As a general purpose algorithm, it was not good. It had a real problem. So how did we address this? Well now, rather than using the cursor as the thing to say you were complete, we changed the, the idea that the cursor was the claim. So you would claim your sequence at this point. You then work with the element that you've just claimed. And when you're done, we would update an available array. And so the arrays map to the slots themselves going forward. The read side, is you just look at where available it's up to, you work with it, and then you update the gating to say it's done. And that way we can work. So quite a simple change. We basically use an extra memory to deal with the fact that we don't want to wait on the other things. Now, the producers don't block each other. They're no longer entangled with each other. Simple change to an algorithm. What does that look like if we run it in a real world system? So this is a distribution of all latencies measured in a system one of my clients had. This is a financial trading system. This was, so it measured the time of every single trade going through the system and put it on a scatter plot. This is a log scale. We're looking here at around 80 microseconds for this to run. So financial trading systems are quite fast. And there's a lot of traffic and noise. So this was the disruptor too. When we moved to Disruptor 3, this was the impact on the whole system. Boom. See that? That little change of going from the variable to the array, because we were no longer blocking now between the producers, made a huge difference to the characteristic. And now also, all of the other effects that I was able to work on started to be more pronounced. They stood out on their own and were able to work with it. So blocking algorithms are kind of interesting and a real problem. So, what if I just needed a queue? So I just want to replace a queue, and I'm not going to use the disruptor, because actually the disruptor as a queue is not really its best use. It's, its best use is to be used for coordinating a graph of dependencies. Many producers and consumers all organized into a graph with data flowing through it. It does a really good job of that. That's much better for what it's designed for. So let's take some of the concepts of Flamport and fast flow again but introducing the ability to use CASs to claim the tail, and we'll move forward ahead independently. So multi-producer, single consumer style queue. Very similar to the disruptor, I'll update the tail with a CAS operation, do that in a spinning loop. I then put my object into the array. I don't need to say anything else to say I'm done, because how do you know you're done? The thing has appeared in the array. 
you use the array itself to signal completion. If it's got a null element, it hasn't yet been put in. When the element's been put in, you can use it. So this is kind of nice as we've taken a step out of what the disruptor's doing if you actually just want it as a queue. What's the consumer do? Well, it looks at where the head is, takes the element out, setting it back to null, and updates the head counter. Incredibly simple. And I see the really fast, really uh, scalable algorithms are all incredibly simple. They're not complex in how they work. So what does this look like from a numbers perspective? So we remember concurrent link Q was the best case of what we get inside the JVM. The figures are all as before. Well, this is like under very light contention, what does the disruptor and the one-to-one -one concurrent queue look like? It's kind of similar. It's a bit better, but kind of similar. They're all kind of in the same ballpark. Notice that this is a lot better because there's a lot less steps in it. There's a lot less cache missing steps, especially in the happy path case. But let's move on and add some load. The, the load's the interesting bit like, and ramp the contention, how does this start to behave under contention? Notice here, contention and spinning cas loops. Spinning cas loops are the great equalizer. All those, so three completely different algorithms, but at the core, they've got a spinning cas loop. They all end up doing roughly the same thing. It's kind of like one of those things, in, like you can look at all the different things you can do for your health. If you take up smoking, you pretty much just neutralize it with everything else. And spinning cas loops are a bit like that. They'll fundamentally limit an algorithm to a given point from a scalability perspective. Locks do similar things, but at a much worse scale. So we're kind of around the 50 micros at that stage. What else can we do? Some people who have used the disruptor may shout out, but the disruptor has got single producer methods and batch methods. Yes, it does, but I want to compare like for like and how it works. So there's other things we could have done, but I'm going to leave that aside. So let's say we want to look at how do I work across processes? I work with multiple languages quite often. I work with multiple VMs that I actually want to keep to moderate sizes so I don't get huge GC pauses because I can contain these. How do I get these things to communicate really fast? Can I communicate across process as quickly as I can within process? What structures are available for this? Well, one of the ones that we've got there is just using a ring buffer. Very simple ring buffer. How does this work? Well, you've got a big, big shared memory file, and you're just going to go around using it over and over again like a ring buffer. How do I produce into it? Well, I do a CAS operation on the tail. I claim some space. I copy in the message I want to put into the ring buffer. I put the header on it. The header tells me it's complete. How do I consume? Well, I read out something uh, tail, and I move forward the tail thought. Really simple, simple protocol of actions between two threads. It still does have a spinning CAS operation on the tail to be able to do that. And we can exchange between producers and consumers across processes. As long as you've got memory ordering operations available to you, you can do this. Well, what's the header look like? Well, very simple protocol for that is we said the frame length, the message type, and the encoded message itself. That's all that's required when we write into the shared ring buffer. And you write the frame length last with the correct memory ordering operation, then you know it's complete. If you zero as you go, you know that the message is not ready until the, the length is actually set. We actually do more than that. We set the frame length first to be the negative value of its length so that you can detect if something crashed partway through doing something and you can then fix it up later. Because if producers die, how do you prevent the whole system from becoming blocked at that stage? You have to be able to detect it, fix it, and move on. But this zeroing out becomes a big cost. Zeroing out will slow down your algorithm because it's kind of fast on the latency side because you get through the queue, you can service really quickly, but after you've been serviced, there's a cleanup operation. The cleanup operation is to go through and zero out the thing. So I'm pointing out that this is going to be good for latency, but it's not so good for throughput compared to some of the alternatives. Now, another thing I've been working on, so when I was working on Aaron, we wanted to achieve some interesting things. We're messaging between different machines, but the real kind of crux of this is we wanted to build a CRDT. The CRDT that we can replicate to another machine where the messages all arrive out of order, they may be delivered many times, but I want to get the data structure to the same state on another machine as it was on the source machine. So we had to build this, and actually, 
we had to build this in a way that was concurrent to work on the same machine as well. And it's actually turned out to be really interesting from an IPC perspective, even though its original design was for working across machines as a CRDT. So how does this one work? Well, again, it's just a big shared memory file. You've got the concept of the tail. Note there's no head pointer in here. You just add a message in, you move the tail forward, add a message, move the tail, let's break this down. You move forward the tail, you copy in the message, you copy on the header. That's very similar to the ring buffer concept. See, what you start discovering is evolution moves these things forward. You don't tend to go forward in massive leaps. You tend to have little leaps every now and again, just the same as what happens in evolution. So we work forward like that. You may start asking, well, do you do one big file that goes on forever? This is where I've seen the fundamental mistake, particularly in some of the academic approaches to this, is people just take the big logical file that goes on forever, but it doesn't consider the physical world. And the physical world has got things like page faults, page cache churn, locking operations inside the page cache. You would not do that. That's a really bad way to go as one big file that goes on forever. In fact, you can lock up Linux to the point where it becomes unresponsive even to root on console. It's a pretty bad situation to be. How do you address it? Well, learn from other disciplines. Like, I took my years backpacking as a great way of fixing this problem. What do you do when you backpack? You very quickly get to the stage where you wash one, wear one, dry one. That's the way you move. You don't have much weight with you. And do the same thing with your buffers. So you rotate them around where you've got an active, a dirty, and a clean. And just going around reusing these over and over again. So, how do we deal with this CAS operation? That was the fundamental limiting thing. I want to move forward and not be hit by this CAS. Well, if I'm going to move forward the tail, I can use an interesting instruction now available in x86 called xadd. And since Java 8, this is available inside the JVM to us now via an intrinsic. What does xadd do? It does that basic spinning CAS loop, but it does it in hardware where it never has the interleaving failure case. So it can read a value, it can update the value by delta you've given it, and give you the value back before, all in a single hardware instruction. So there's now not that interleaving problem where I read, another thread reads, one goes to update, the other one goes to update, and one fails, and you have to go around that process again. The whole thing happens in hardware in a single instruction. So I do an X add. I claim my space at this stage, so one thread's done that. There's a race going on. Another thread has done an X add at the same time. I'm going to show the particularly hard case that we have to deal with, because if you're just within the buffer normally, that's not a problem. And ring buffers can't use this technique because the head can overrun the tail. By using the rotating buffers, we actually got an opportunity to use X add that you couldn't use elsewhere. So X add's been used to move the tail forward. The first message gets copied in just the same as it normally does. The second message that was racing with the first message has moved tail beyond the end of the buffer. Notice the tail is now down here. Well, it can work out if it was the one that tripped the buffer. Like another thread could be racing as well, moves XR down further, or the tail down further. The one that tripped the end of the buffer now has a responsibility. And how do you know you've tripped the buffer? If the value you get before was within the range of the buffer, but with your delta on top of it is outside of the range of buffer, simple mathematics, you know you've tripped. And you don't need anybody else to tell you that. It's just your responsibility under the protocol to rotate. So what you do is you fill in the buffer to finish it with a padding record. You rotate, which is just a simple ordered instruction to say what is the next array to be used. And you copy in the message as before. Now we're doing pretty much the similar things we did with the ring buffer but we're doing them with some interesting characteristics. These data structures now are effectively persistent for the time that the active and the dirty is staying around and alive. And we can use this single instruction, which is a weight-free instruction, to do that. And we move things forward. How does it work for readers? Well, it's even better than the single reader. We can have as many readers as we want because it's a persistent data structure. And all of these readers can read it without any locks. They just walk forward reading the length field, read the next length field, read the next length field. Whenever they reach zero, they've reached the end of the queue. It's that simple. Really, really simple. What do we do about the zeroing problem? Because that has to be done. Well, we do it on a background thread. 
Rather than make it the responsibility of the consumer, we make it the responsibility of what we call the conductor in the system that zeroes in the background. Now the throughput problem has been solved as well. We've got the latency solved throughput and what's it look like for predictable latency. Well, let's look at some figures. So go back to the non-contended case again, sort of like just one message, maybe in ramping up the three producers. Notice like in this case, error on IPC is a bit slower than the ring buffer. Why should it be slower with such a simple design in how it works? Well, it's because it's putting a much more complicated header onto the object because this is actually the header that can be used to go onto the network as well. So we could simplify it and use it in purely the IPC case, but we're using exactly the same code to use IPC as also ship it across the network. So there's actually no difference in either of the two. So let's ramp up the load. Let's look at it with a larger burst in size. Notice that the ring buffer has got better than before. We were fundamentally limited before. We've gone from the 50 odd microseconds now down to 34, even under contention. So the ring buffer is a nice step forward. So kind of pop quiz here to the room, that's using the spinning CAS. Why is it better? Why can I actually go across processes faster and a greater throughput with more predictable latency than I can within using those other things. Any ideas to what it would be? It's the process dependence to the process then. So you've got bit No pinning in any of these cases. So you're, you're accessing those multiple actors, so you want to be able to access them. Nothing as complicated as that, but there's a real nasty hidden case. You're getting a different thread schedule when you come back to the problem. Nope. Not, nothing at that sort of level. It's kind of interesting. What's going on is really simple. Has anyone heard of a concept called false sharing? One of the evil performance killers. Two cases of false sharing in the previous algorithms that don't exist in the ring buffer algorithm. One is the data is now inlined into the array because the data ends up spacing the actual data out. You don't get false sharing. Where on the array references, you get false sharing between the threads trying to write that. Then with GC, there's this evil thing called card marking. So every reference you set in Java it marks a card on the heap so the garbage collector knows where to go and look. This is off heap. It doesn't involve the garbage collector card marking any of this. So the ring buffer ends up being a lot better because of some pretty nasty and silent performance killers that are in there. And so when we look at like a lot of scaling up algorithms on the JVM, we need to be looking at some things that don't impact some of these fundamental design problems that the JVM has for scalability in a concurrent sense. So what about this spinning CAS? Was it a major step forward by not having that, by using Aaron's uh, ability to use lock X add? Well, if we look now at the contended case, we're much better off, like much better off. That's a lot of interesting figures. How does this look differently? Let's just graph it and make it. So we start off with our link blocking queue and a rev blocking queue and concurrent link queue. This is what we get in the JDK, the kind of evolution through the disruptor and using the concurrent array queue inspired by LAMP ports work, then the ring buffer, then Aaron. That is what it's like when you have got contention hitting these things. So if we want to scale up, this is what starts to matter. Where are we spending our time? What can we do to eliminate this contention and work around it? Kind of interestingly, where would you use something like this? So let's take a really simple example, logging. I don't know why our industry hasn't copped on to this, but logging is a messaging problem. That's what it is. Yet the abominations we have in Java for loggers, I'm sorry, they're just disgusting. The APIs, the design, everything. So you think, like, Okay, what's logging really useful for? Debugging. You get a process crash. Now, your process crashes in Java, it writes to a buffer that whenever it reaches 8K, it writes that buffer down to disk. So chances are that the thing that will tell you why your program was likely to crash is in that buffer that gets lost when it crashes. Why is that not messaging out of process to somewhere where you can actually read and find out what's going on? And the fact is that it's actually synchronous through the whole thing. It's just insane. So I think we should be doing lots of better things with logging. And this is a, the algorithm that is exactly the problem we're dealing with. So where can we go next? What have we kind of learned along the way? 
Well, there's a number of things that stood out. So I'm working with some people, and we're, we're doing this in both Java and C++ at the same time. And I get really frustrated that every time I get a big algorithmic advance, we get Java to beat C++. And in the C++, you can just, well, I can do that in C++, what you've just done in Java, even better. And there's some fundamental things that are getting us. So for example, <coughs> spin loops on this sort of stuff, whenever we're doing it, we end up with problems because our modern processors speculate. They're out of order speculation engines. And what they'll do is they hit a branch, they'll guess where that branch is going to go, and then based upon that, we'll go whizzing off in one direction or another. With these spin loops, they guess wrong, and that has to be unwind. It wastes a lot of energy, and it wastes a lot of architectural state. There is ways to address this, like the pause instruction in x86. We can use that from C or C++. Java, we have a proposal to add thread spin yield hint. This, I've seen, drop 20 nanoseconds off latency on these things and use a lot less energy and be much more cooperative across all the threads, so things like that. The biggest things that me that I keep seeing is the data dependent loads in Java. Java loads everything through pointers. And that's one thing our processors cannot deal well with. They cannot speculate where the next load's gonna be whenever you're data dependent on the previous load. We need to get around that. We need to model aggregates on the heap and we need to be able to do stack allocation to do this well on the JVM. Object layout is a proposal to address that and value types is for the stack side. So if we had those, we would be much better off. I found some interesting things with memory copying. So for example, within the CPU cache subsystem, we should be able to copy at many tens of gigabytes per second. Tens of gigabytes, like 50 to 80 gigabytes per second should not be a problem. From C, I can do that. From Java, I cannot. Because some of our copy routines in Java if you're not aligned, doesn't use the right instructions in the latest processors, and doesn't benefit from some of these copy techniques. I've seen them drop down to sort of around two, 2.5 gig per second copying between cores when it should be sort of 10, 20 times that in some of its performance. This is just things that need to be fixed. How can you sort of fudge some of this in Java? So turn on things like G1, GC. It aligns all of our big arrays in the humongous region on page boundaries, and you can see C-style performance with Java for certain cases. You can see that it's kind of okay in some cases and not in other cases. It needs to be fixed. And then there's some really fundamentally bad design in the APIs. This is actually my biggest beef with most performance when I come to is API design. Whenever you design an API wrong, you really limit the implications of how things can be done internally. So for example, the queue interface for offer and poll conflates the concerns for is something available and is it empty? Those, that sounds subtly different, but it's actually really important. So for example, in a concurrent algorithm, quite often something is not yet available because there's a blocking action, but then you end up blocking more threads because you've also conflated in the, is you, are you empty or are you full? And as a result, you block more threads and the whole thing just spirals down a hole. We should not have used the normal collections APIs for the concurrent stuff. Concurrent programming is fundamentally different than single-threaded programming from the different concerns. Yet we conflated those together because, oh, it looks easy, it kind of looks and smells a bit the same. It's not, it's very, very different. So kind of quickly in closing, Amazon just recently announced that we're gonna get the new X1 instances early next year. We're talking over 100 V cores, two terabytes of memory. We're gonna have many spinning wheels in these boxes. How are we gonna communicate? How are we gonna have our algorithms work together? We need to start fundamentally thinking about this, and we need to work out what's blocking what, where are the contention points, how are we gonna scale up? Because our current approaches are not scaling up and they're not working. Where can you find some of the code for this? There's benchmarks, are all up on GitHub, along with the Agrona and our own projects that have all of the data structures that have been listed here. And on that, I thank you very much, and I think we're nearly out of time. Do we have any questions? So, when you were talking about the air on shared memory file thing earlier, and you're saying mm -hmm. you might have one producer that moves the tail pointer beyond the um, end of the file, 
Yes. And then that has responsibility for moving to a new file. Mm -hmm. Could that potentially stall and block all the other producers? Yes, so that, that is a potential stall. Uh, so the one that gets the responsibility, if there's others are coming behind it and they're wanting to use that new file, they've got to wait on that rotation happening. So one of the things we've done is we've put a lot of effort into making sure that that rotation is as cheap as possible. In fact, it's a, it's a rare reference flip. So it's an incredibly cheap operation to do. There is always the possibility that the thread that's doing that takes an interrupt whilst that's actually happening. So, so from a purist sense, it's not perfect. From a measured sense in real world tests, it looks pretty good. mentioned uh, the intrinsic in Java 8 for XAD. Uh, yes. Could you just tell us a little bit more? How, how do you... Yes. So uh, if you want to get a lot of atomic operations in Java, the best recommended way to do that is to use the atomic, so atomic int, atomic long, atomic reference, all of that. You've got the CAS operations, the get and add increment and get, all of those sorts of things. Underneath they call a thing called unsafe. And this is all happening off heap, so you can't use the standard built-in APIs. You can get at unsafe directly using reflection, and it's got a method called get and add. You can provide it the uh, address that you're going to do that operation on. I would recommend you don't use that directly because of bounds checking and other things. So like the Agrona library we provide, we provide a thing called unsafe buffer which does bounds checking and things in there, and it will let you get at that. So you can just construct an unsafe buffer, you can give it a map byte buffer, a normal byte buffer, an array, whatever, and then you can perform those operations directly on that. Come Java 9, we'll hopefully have var handles, which will let us do this as a first class thing. But until then, we have to be a little bit naughty. Any more questions? Thank you, Thank you all. <laughs>